Hi, this is the first lecture in the basic science related to uh, orthopedic. We're going to speak about coagulation, DVT, and pulmonary embolism. A good source that you can use to study your final exam is this book written by myself. We will start with discussing the clotting cascade. The clotting cascade is the steps that result in formation of the blood clot. There is two pathways, the extrinsic pathway and the intrinsic pathway. The extrinsic pathway is faster and it's called extrinsic because uh, it's, um, uh, it requires a factor that's actually not inside the blood vessels. That's why it's called extrinsic, which is the tissue factor. Uh, the extrinsic pathway is, uh, uh, is measured by PT. However, now we use something called the INR um, the, to decrease the variation in the PT. So it's, it starts with the trauma. As we said, the trauma will expose factor 7, which is inside the blood vessel, to the tissue factor, which is outside. Again, that's the reason of calling it extrinsic. And then they will cause tissue factor, factor active factor 7 complex, which will act on factor 10, converting it into active factor 10. From here to the end, this is called the common pathway. The other pathway is the intrinsic pathway, which is measured by the PTT or partial thromboplastin time. Um, it uh, starts with factor 12, which will uh, with and um, the high molecular weight kinetogen and the precalicrine, um, uh, together with factor 11, factor 9, and factor 8. All this will result in activation of factor uh, 10. Uh, this will become active factor 10, will uh, now act on prothrombin, changing it into uh, thrombin, uh, which is active factor 2. Um, and then uh, this will act on fibrinogen to convert it in, into fibrin, which is active factor 1. So uh, the factor 1 in the cascade is the, fibr uh, is the fibrinogen, which converts into active factor 1, which is fibrin. This, um, with, the, with the help of factor 13, will form the blood clot or the cross-linked uh, fibrin polymer. So again, there is the intrinsic pathway, the extrinsic pathway. Extrinsic pathway is called this because it, it requires one factor outside the blood vessel. Extrinsic pathway is measured by the PT, and now we use the INR. Intrinsic pathway is, it takes a little bit longer time. Uh, it's measured by the PTT. Uh, both of them will come to this area, which is called the, the uh, common pathway. It starts with factor 10, which will become active factor 10, and then it will work on factor 2 to convert it to, into active factor 2, which is the thrombin, and then this will work on factor 1, uh, which converting it from fibrinogen to fibrin, uh, which uh, with the help of factor 13 will become the, the blood clot or the closely uh, linked uh, fibrin polymer. Pulmonary embolism is one of the important topics that you need to know for your final exam. Uh, it is uh, commonly asked because, as we all know, uh, surgeries in orthopedic can result in DVT, and this can result in pulmonary embolism, and massive cases of pulmonary embolism can be fatal. That's why it's important to know some of the facts related to pulmonary embolism. A patient who will have pulmonary embolism will complain of um, tachypnea, which is increased respiratory rate, and dyspnea, which is uh, shortness of breath. Um, and the initial uh, model, initial uh, workup that we do is usually chest X-ray, AKG, and arterial blood gas uh, to get a quick idea of what's going on and exclude other causes of uh, dyspnea like myocardial infarction. Uh, so, as we said, the patient will be complaining of dyspnea, which is shortness of breath, and tachypnea, which is uh, increased heart rate. Uh, and in this slide, we're going to focus on the uh, result of the uh, workup for the cases of pulmonary embolism. Uh, as we said, arterial blood gas uh, is the, um, one of the things that we uh, do for the initial work out uh, um, of these cases. Uh, it's not very specific uh, for pulmonary embolism, but it will show, of course, hypoxemia, which is decreased uh, oxygen concentration in the blood. Uh, and in most cases, it will show actually hypocapnia, which is decreased CO2. I know that some of you think uh, that pulmonary embolism uh, uh, will result in increased CO2. However, most cases will have decreased CO2 uh, because the patient will have uh, increased heart rate, uh, which is the tachypnea, and this will uh, uh, wash most of the CO2 from the blood. Uh, so the patient in most cases will have a decreased uh, PCO2, uh, um, uh, which is hypocapnia. And as we know, whenever you have decreased CO2, you get respiratory alkalosis. So the arterial blood gas will show hypoxemia. 
in uh, decreased oxygen, hypocapnia in most cases, decreased CO2, and uh, any decrease in CO2 will result in respiratory alkalosis. Uh, however, the massive cases of the PE uh, can result in hypercapnia, which is increased CO2, and of course, whenever you have increased CO2, you will have respiratory alkalosis, and in these cases, they may also, the patient have shock, so he may have metabolic acidosis, so he will have a combined respiratory and metabolic acidosis. So arterial blood gas, one of the initial uh, steps that we do will show a uh, hypoxemia. Uh, most cases will show hypocapnia, decreased CO2 because of the increased respiratory rate and respiratory alkalosis. Uh, increased al uh, alveolar arterial gradient, which is the difference of the oxygen concentration in, uh, uh, in the lung, which is the alveoli here, and the blood, the arterial, uh, and this will give you um, increased in the uh, AA uh, gradient. It is the increase in the, diff in the concentration of the uh, oxygen in the lung and in the blood, uh, because not all the oxygen in the lung will uh, go to the blood, so you will have an increased A capital a small gradient uh, which is um, associated with pulmonary embolism. Uh, AKG, we said most cases gets an AKG to exclude myocardial infarction. Uh, some cases of pulmonary embolism may show a new onset right bundle branch block. Uh, blood work uh, uh, will show increased D-dimers and uh, pre-naturetic uh, peptides. This is not very specific. Uh, a commonly used imaging modality now, if the patient is stable enough to go to the uh, CT suite, is the computed uh, tomography and geography, which is CT and geography. Uh, so uh, CT and geography is commonly used now if the patient uh, uh, can uh, be uh, transferred to the CT area, he is stable enough, and uh, it will show the blood clot in the arterial system. You can see it here uh, in this picture um, uh, from this source. Uh, there is uh, here blood clots in the arterial system uh, of the uh, uh, lung here. So uh, CT and geography, it's commonly used now uh, if the patient is stable enough to the, go to the CT area. Uh, a ventilation perfusion scan, uh, this is a scintigraphy scan, uh, uh, which is like nuclear imaging study. It's less commonly uh, used now. It will show a, a VQ mismatch. It means that the ventilation and the perfusion, there will be mismatch uh, between them because uh, not, area, not all areas with uh, oxygen will have blood because of the pulmonary embolism. Uh, the ventilation perfusion scan used to be uh, done uh, more. Now uh, it is uh, much less done and um, more and more we're using the CT and geography or uh, even normal CT sometimes. So CT and geography uh, uh, will show the uh, uh, blood clot as you can see it here uh, and it is uh, commonly used now in a stable patient. Another very important uh, concept is the mechanism of action of the uh, antithrombotic medications. So after many surgeries in orthopedic, uh, we give uh, medications to decrease the instance of DVT. So how do these medications work? Um, this picture is from Radford Vascular Surgery, uh, and it shows the mechanism of action of the unfractionated heparin, the low molecular weight heparin, and the uh, fondaparinox, which is the pentasaccharide. Uh, so the unfractionated heparin, it's a large molecule. It will inhibit, uh, it will uh, work with um, antithrombin, uh, and uh, the, um, the unfractionated heparin antithrombin uh, uh, combination will work on both active factor 10 and active factor 2, which is the thrombin, and inhibit both. It's one to one inhibition. So unfractionated heparin is a large molecule. It will work uh, by activation of the antithrombin, and the antithrombin uh, heparin complex will inhibit factor 10 and uh, active factor 2 in one to one. The low molecular weight heparin, as you see here, it's much smaller molecule than the fractionated heparin. It will also work with the same concept uh, st um, uh, by stimulation of the antithrombin, and it will uh, work mainly on active factor 10. So the low molecular weight has four times, uh, approximately four times uh, uh, inhibition of fa active factor 10 than active factor 2. So low molecular weight, a, a little bit smaller than the unfractionated heparin, will uh, work the same way by activation of the antithrombin. It will be mainly directed towards factor active factor 10, four times more than thrombin. Uh, the fondaparinox, which is a pentasaccharide, it's much smaller. It's only this part of the heparin. It will, st will still work with the same way. Uh, stimulation of the antithrombin, uh, pentasaccharide, uh, with the antithrombin will inhibit only factor 10. So it does not have any anti. Uh, it, it has not. It doesn't have any effect on the active factor 2. 
So unfractionated heparin have one-to-one -one inhibition of factor 10 and have active factor 2 through the activation of the antithrombin. Low molecular weight still work in antithrombin. It's m more on uh, factor 10, so it's four times more than the thrombin. Uh, and the pentasaccharide, the fundaparinox, only work on active factor 10 and does not have any uh, effect on active factor 2. Uh, now there are um, uh, a newer group of uh, chemoprophylaxis that works directly on factor 10. So it affects directly factor 10. It does not work through antithrombin. And because it's direct active factor 10, it will always win with exaban. XA is the active factor 10, BAN is like prevent. So X, and whenever you see any medication that ends with exaban and they ask you what is the mechanism of action, it is direct inhibition of factor 10. It does not work through antithrombin. Uh, like rivoraxaban or apixaban, they all end with exaban because it's active factor 10 prevention. It's direct effect on the active factor 10. It does not work through antithrombin. Uh, there is also a newer medication uh, that will work directly uh, on uh, thrombin, so it does not act through antithrombin, uh, and uh, some of these are uh, IV agents, some of them are oral agents. Uh, another two important medications for DVT prophylaxis is the warfarin, uh, which is known as the comedin, uh, and the aspirin. Uh, warfarin uh, or comedin works by inhibition of vitamin K uh, uh, epoxide reductase, um, uh, which will lead to decrease the carboxylation of the vitamin K dependent factor 2, 7, 9, and 10. Uh, so vitamin K dependent factor 2, 7, 9, and 10, these factors has to undergo carboxylation uh, using the enzyme epoxide reductase to be active. Uh, the warfarin will inhibit this step, so uh, these factors will be replaced with decarboxylated factor. So the warfarin uh, inhibit the vitamin K epoxide reductase in uh, inhibiting the carboxylation of factor 2, 7, 9, and 10. Aspirin, on the other hand, it works uh, on the platelet level. Uh, it's a cyclooxygenase inhibitor. It inhibits the formation of thromboxane A2, which is an essential element for formation of blood clot. So aspirin works against cyclooxygenase. It's a cyclooxygenase inhibitor. It will result in decrease in thromboxane A2. Warfarin uh, inhibit the vitamin K epoxide reductase, thus inhibiting carboxylation of factor 2, um, 7, 9, and 10. Some of the important uh, points about the antithrombotic medication that uh, sometimes comes in the exam uh, for the warfarin, uh, it's metabolized in the liver. So the comedin uh, or the warfarin, uh, this medication is metabolized in the liver. Uh, that's why if you have a patient with liver failure, you have to be cautious when using uh, the comedin. Uh, and the plasma half-life of this medication is about 40 hours. So it takes a long time for this medication to reserve. Uh, heparin and low molecular weight overdose is reversed by the protamine, so they have both an, um, an antidote, which is the protamine, uh, and both the low molecular weight and the fondaparinox are metabolized in the kidney. Especially the fonda, uh, fonda parinox uh, cannot be given in any patient with uh, renal failure. The low molecular weight, um, uh, you can uh, give a renal adjusted dose, fonda parinox, uh, be very aware that it's completely contraindicated in any patient with with renal failure. Uh, uh, the dabigatran, as we discussed, this will work directly by inhibition of factor, active factor 2. It's oral medication and it, it's reversible. The antidote is idarucizumab. Uh, so this, we took this when we discussed the mechanism of action. Uh, dabigatran, it's an oral agent and it is reversible. There's an antidote. It works directly by factor inhibition of active factor 2. Um, also, we discussed anything which act, ends with uh, exaban, rivoroxaban, and apixaban. Uh, these two medications are becoming now much more commonly used. Uh, the rivaroxaban is the Xeralto, and the apixaban is the Eliquix, and both are commonly now used because they are oral. Um, you do, patients do not have to get injections, uh, and they are uh, much more commonly used now than before. Um, these are oral medications and uh, no antidote is available for them. 
A very important medication that we use now uh, much more commonly in orthopedic is the TXA or the tranexamic acid. Uh, it's totally different uh, goal than what we discussed before. We have been discussing in the previous uh, slides uh, the DVT prophylaxis, the medication that uh, inhibits formation of the blood clot. Uh, TXA or tranexamic acid uh, has a completely different goal. Uh, it prevent or it act uh, to uh, uh, help stopping the bleeding. Uh, so it actually uh, it's stimulate the formation of a stable blood clot. Uh, so the medications we discussed before are DVT prophylaxis. They inhibit uh, formation of the blood clot, TXA or tranexamic acid. Uh, it, um, it's used to, uh, to help stopping the bleeding uh, by formation of a, st a stable blood clot. It has been uh, commonly used uh, in the last few years in orthopedic. Uh, it's um, now becoming the standard of care in some total hips and total knees and revision cases and major fracture fixation to give the patient uh, a gram of tranexamic acid. Uh, so uh, it, how does tranexamic acid works? Expect that to see more often in uh, exams because as I said, it, it has been uh, used much more common in the last few years and whenever you have a medication uh, used uh, commonly, expect to see it in the exam. Uh, the tranexamic acid um, or the TXA um, works on this step here. So first, I'd like to tell you what happens. So in, in, the, in, the, in the first uh, slide, we discussed uh, uh, the uh, ca clotting cascade, which ends with fibrin. The fibrin becomes a stable blood clot. Uh, so uh, that was the clotting cascade. Uh, however, this does not stop in, uh, in that step. There is a material called the plasmine, which comes from plasminogen through something called tissue plasminogen activator, will convert the plasminogen into plasmine, and the plasmine will come and work on the stable blood clot and the fibrin and disintegrate it and convert it to a fibrin degradation uh, products. So this is uh, called uh, fibrinolysis. So this step here is called fibrinolysis, in which the plasmine will work on a stable blood clot, converting the fibrin to fibrin, uh, fibrin degradation products. The tranexamic acid works by inhibiting this step. In the, it inhibits the, uh, the conversion of plasminogen into plasmin. It binds to plasminogen uh, and uh, it, uh, convert, it, it, it inhibits the formation of, it, it binds to the plasminogen and it uh, inhibits the formation of plasmin. At a higher dose, the tranexamic acid can become a direct inhibitor of plasmin. Um, so, uh, but in, in, in the dose that uh, use most often, it acts as uh, by inhibition of uh, conversion of the plasminogen into plasmin. So the TXA, it inhibits the uh, step which is called fibrinolysis, which is the plasmin working on the fibrin, uh, fibrin uh, degrading it into fibrin degradation product. How it prevent this step? Uh, mainly by inhibition of formation of plas uh, uh, inhibition of conversion of the plasminogen into the plasmin, and at a higher dose, it can be directly inhibitor of the plasmin. Thank you for listening to this lecture and following my channel and there will be more lectures for other topics in orthopedics.